In this video, we're going to look at activation energy and catalysts. So if you remember, we said that in order for a collision to be successful and effective, in meaning in order for your reactants to turn into products, your reactant molecules have to collide with enough energy. And we call that energy threshold the activation energy. So what that means, if you have reactants A and B and they collide, um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have a reaction. If they meet the activation energy, they both have enough energy, um, then they will turn into products, like in this case, C and B. But if they collide with not the right amount of energy, then you don't have a successful collision and they stay as reactants. Um, they just bounce off of each other. Um, so remember, only a fraction of collisions will actually result in a successful reaction. Not only do you have to have the right amount of energy, um, but you also have to have the right orientation, meaning the bonds have to line up the right way and your atoms have to line up the right way for where you want your new bond formed and things like that. Um, so we can actually relate this to one of our favorite graphs from our gas chapter, which was the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. And if you remember, this is showing your y-axis is number of particles and your x-axis was either kinetic energy or um, velocity or speed of your molecule. And what this is showing is that in any sample, um, though you have an average kinetic energy and an average speed, not all your molecules are actually traveling at the same speed. Some are traveling a lot slower, some are traveling a lot faster. Um, so when you have these reactions, these collisions between your reactants, not every one of them is going to have enough kinetic energy to meet the activation energy. And if you look at this, a large number of them will not have the activation energy. So if we plot activation energy on this curve here, um, then you can see that really only a small fraction of molecules might be able to overcome it. Um, and have enough energy to actually form products. Now, the next question is, how does temperature change this graph? Now, if you change the temperature, that will not change your activation energy, but it will change the average kinetic energy and the average speed of the samples in your, mo in your, in your sample, um, the av this average molecule's speed. So what would I think about what would happen to this curve? At a higher temperature, this curve moves to the right and starts to flatten out. The area under it would be the same because you have the same number of molecules. So there's this, sometimes there's this misconception that temperature changes activation energy. No, it doesn't. Notice if I increase the temperature, I have not moved the location of activation energy. But I did shift this graph to the right um, and it flattened out. So the average kinetic energy is now higher. So if you look at this, now a larger number of molecules or a larger fraction of collisions are going to be more successful. Um, and therefore you're going to increase the rate. Why? Because you have more successful collisions because they are more powerful collisions on the most part. So this is why the reaction rate increases. And this is also why the rate constant increases. Um, so one more time for the people in the back. Temperature does not change the activation energy. Activation energy is the exact same whether you have low temperature or high temperature. However, it moves your average uh, velocity higher. It moves your average kinetic energy higher. And it's shown by this graph, shifts it to the right, flattens it out. So you have a larger number of molecules able to have to meet your activation energy threshold that are able now to have a successful collision. Um, there's this equation called the Arrhenius equation. They've kind of taken it off the AP exam. Um, it's not on your formula sheet. Um, and you, I'm never going to ask you to memorize or plug into this equation, but you should understand some of the implications. Notice that this is your rate constant K. And look at what your K depends on. Look at the variables in here. Um, A is just a term called the frequency factor. It represents the likelihood collisions would occur. Um, then you have E, which is like goes along with natural logs, that E. Um, and then look at this exponent. You have negative activation energy on top over R, which is your ideal gas constant, and T, which is your Kelvin temperature. And this R, if you're wondering, wait, this is energy. This R has the units of energy, which makes sense why you have that R on your formula sheet that has units of energy. We will use that R at a later time as well. And again, you don't ever have to plug into this, but look at the relationship between K and what it depends on. Notice the things that are going to affect the rate constant are, one is temperature, which we mentioned before, um, and one is activation energy. 
if you look at this, how does activation energy affect K? This is a negative exponent, and activation energy is in the numerator. So if activation energy goes up, that means that you're going to have a larger negative exponent here. So that means that your rate constant would go down, and your rate, therefore, would be lower if you have a smaller K. Um, and this kind of makes sense that if you have a really high activation energy, that your, your reaction is likely to go slower, right? It would be a lot harder for successful collisions to occur because you need higher and higher amounts of energy to make that happen. Um, and then look at temperature. Temperature is in the denominator of a negative exponent. So if temperature goes up, then you're dividing by a bigger number and it makes this negative exponent smaller. So that means that makes K larger and the rate is larger. And again, I'm never going to have you plug into this equation or even remember that it exists. But these are implications that you should know and they are just kind of logical. That activation energy goes up, your rate constant goes down, and your rate goes down. Temperature goes up, your rate constant goes up, and your rate is faster. And notice that concentration is not in here at all. Concentration does not affect your rate constant. We had talked about that earlier in the chapter, um, that this is why K um, is in your rate law equation separately from your uh, concentration. What is a catalyst? A catalyst is a substance that changes the rate of the reaction without undergoing a permanent chemical change. Um, there's two types of catalysts. We can call them heterogeneous or heterogeneous, depends how you want to say it, or homogeneous and homogeneous. And it all depends on if it's the same phase as your reactant. So heterogeneous means it's in a different phase. For instance, your reactants might be gases and your catalyst might be a solid. Homogeneous means it's in the same phase, meaning they might all be aqueous or all solids or all gases, so on and so forth. Um, for example, um, hydrogen peroxide, um, here's a reaction without a catalyst. You could actually add a catalyst and make this go faster, and it would actually happen in two steps here with a catalyst. Um, and if you look at this, um, which is your catalyst? So we looked at intermediates before. Catalysts are a little different. Catalysts are there to start with in a reaction. They get used up, but then they are regenerated. Why? Because they don't undergo any permanent changes. So if you look at this, here's my overall reaction. Br minus is actually a catalyst. It's not in my overall reaction, but it's there as a reactant to start with in one of the steps. It gets used up. And then it's regenerated in another step. So if I was to do my overall reaction, I would cross this out. It's on the left and on the right. But it's different than an intermediate. In this reaction, Br2 would be an intermediate. It's made in the first step, and it's used up later on. So we never actually see the intermediate when we're done with the reaction. However, the catalyst is there to start with and there to end with. It's just not in the overall reaction. Okay. Um, so this is just a summary of what I said. Catalyst represents a reactant in one step and then it's, used, and then it's regenerated later. Um, the purpose is to lower the activation energy by providing an alternate mechanism. An intermediate is made in one step as a product and then used up as a following step. Neither is typically present in the overall reaction. Um, you can have a catalyst in your rate law. You do not want to have an intermediate. Why? Because the catalyst is there to start with and there to end. So it's something that you can easily measure, where an intermediate is something that's used up right away after being made. And it's really hard to measure the concentration at any point in your reaction. Um, so here's an example. Take a moment. Tell me what's the catalyst and what's the intermediate. There may be more than one answer. So the catalyst would be NO. It's there to start with, and then it's re it's used up. You know, it's a reactant, and then there's a product later. So it, if it, I would cross it out, it's not in my overall reaction, but it's a catalyst because it's there to start with and then regenerated. Intermediate, there's two. NO2 is made, then used up. O is um, made and then used up, and neither of them are in my overall reaction. Those are intermediates. Um, how does catalysts affect this um, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve? Um, catalysts wouldn't shift the curve in either direction. However, it would move the activation energy. So without a catalyst, here I could plot my activation energy. Here's the fraction of molecules that can overcome a successful collision um, or have a successful collision. Adding a catalyst would lower the activation energy. So see how it's actually moving, and now a greater fraction of molecules can overcome the activation energy. 
So catalysts operate by lowering the activation energy. When you add a ca catalyst, you increase the number of effective collisions, more able to um, have an effective collision. Um, and here's just one more time for people in the back, plotted on the same graph. Here's without a catalyst. Here's the activation energy with a catalyst. By adding a catalyst, I do not shift this graph. The graph shifts with temperature, um, but it does give me a greater fraction that can overcome the activation energy by moving that actual activation energy threshold. Okay, um, note um, enzymes are biological catalysts. You probably heard about that in biology. Um, and the active site on enzymes bond to what's called a substrate. Um, and a lot of times, once you fill up all the active sites on an enzyme, um, your, cattle, your, um, your reaction will not be affected by adding more reactant because all your active sites are filled. So a lot of times, once you fill up the active sites, your rate becomes zero order with respect to a certain reactant that uses that catalyst. Um, and, and just showing that, like, if you, you add a catalyst, the rate can go up and up, but only to a certain point until you fill up all the active sites, and then it will have no effect on the rate.